Despite the generosity and tolerance of U.S. administration, still a hero of the Filipinos is 71-year-old Emilio Aguinaldo, leader of the bloody insurrection against American occupation, which for two years up to 1901 kept the islands in a constant state of war. Champions of unconditional independence, General Aguinaldo and his followers have long resented the presence of U.S. armed forces as a permanent encroachment upon the territorial integrity of their land and have never ceased to demand the withdrawal of what they still regard as a symbol of Western imperialism. For 25 years, loudest voice and self-appointed leader of the Philippine independence movement has been Manuel Luis Quezon. Six years ago, when Congress voted full and unconditional independence for the Philippines to take effect in 1946, Manuel Quezon journeyed to Washington for an event which was his greatest personal triumph. For his services in the fight for freedom, a grateful people elected him the first president of their new commonwealth, soon to become a sovereign state. Not until the inauguration of Manuel Quezon did Filipinos fully realize that 1946 would mean not only the withdrawal of U.S. High Commissioners and Governors General, but that from the date of their final sovereignty, they must face a grave new responsibility, the preservation and protection of the independence they had won. In order to establish some measure of national defense, the Filipinos have adopted compulsory military training and an armament program which calls for the expenditure of $8 million a year for the next six years. By 1946, they hope to have an army of 10,000 regulars and 300,000 reserves, all of them equipped with modern weapons from U.S. arsenals, gun factories, and ammunition depots. And its officers and men are being trained in U.S. Army strategy and tactics. Number one soldier of the Philippines is its 60-year-old field marshal and military advisor, General Douglas MacArthur, one-time U.S. Chief of Staff. Great and good friend of Manuel Quezon, Field Marshal MacArthur is reputedly paid $50,000 a year to give the Philippines the benefit of his military experience. Pride of Douglas MacArthur and of President Quezon is the model Philippine Military Academy, whose 400 cadets, the best of the island's youth, must live for four years like West Pointers before being commissioned second lieutenants in the new and growing Philippine Army. Here the young Filipino first learns that his new nation is essentially defenseless against any attack in force by a naval power. That the island's best defense is their long-range coast artillery, able to harass an invader, but unable to prevent an invasion. But until the date set for their complete independence, the Philippines feel safe for the U.S. is morally bound to protect and defend them. Since September 1939, the U.S. Army Air Corps has more than doubled the number of its planes and personnel in the Philippines. Today, U.S. Far East defenses include the latest types of military aircraft, fighters, reconnaissance planes, and fast bombers. Based at Cavite, home port and navy yard of the U.S. Asiatic Fleet, is a newly augmented force of 45 light naval vessels. Though by the terms of Philippine independence, the United States is under no obligation to defend the islands after 1946, the U.S. Navy has reserved the right to maintain permanently the operating bases built and developed during the 47 years of U.S. rule. For two decades, a constant source of concern to Americans and Filipinos alike has been the steady and persistent economic penetration of the islands by their hard-working and ambitious neighbors, the Japanese. Subsidized by their government, Japanese immigrants, despite restrictions imposed upon foreigners, 
have managed to gain a firm foothold in Philippine business and commerce, now control 35% of all retail trade. Today in Far Eastern waters, Japanese merchant ships have replaced British and Scandinavian cargo carriers, called home to the war. Though by law foreigners may acquire no real property in the Philippines, whole Japanese colonies have sprung up throughout the islands, on land bought or leased through dummy transactions. In the province of Davao, Japanese settlers hold more than half the arable land, and throughout the entire Commonwealth, they outnumber U.S. colonials five to one. Today in Manila, there are many who believe that a Japanese fifth column, an advance guard for occupation of the Philippines, is already at work under the leadership of Benino Ramos, chief of the Ganap party, whose main appeal is its crusade for immediate and unconditional severance of all U.S. ties, political and economic. Since its leader's return in 1938 from three years of self-imposed exile in Japan, the Ganap party has consistently heckled both Philippine and American officials. Early in 1940, President Quezon, alarmed by mounting Japanese ambitions in the South Pacific, and in the face of Tokyo's violent protests, makes a bold move to limit Japanese immigration to a nominal quota of 500 a year. Overnight in the Philippines rises a new political faction, the Civic League for Re-Examination, which many believe has Quezon's silent blessing. By the thousands, the League is enlisting Filipinos in its campaign to exchange a precarious independence for the security of dominion status under the U.S. flag, so long as warrior nation Japan is on the march. In Washington, President Quezon's emissary, the Philippine resident commissioner, Miguel Elizalde, long a lobbyist for independence, today is quietly seeking U.S. assurance that the Philippines will not be entirely cast adrift. On Capitol Hill, the Senate Committee on Insular Affairs, chairman by Maryland's Miller D. Tidings, hears that it may soon be asked to reconsider the whole question of Philippine independence. We're committed to a policy of complete independence for the Philippines. They've asked for it. They must decide now. They can't have their cake and eat it too. And back in Manila, Manuel Quezon faces the gravest dilemma of his career. For he, above all others, has championed the cause of a free and independent Philippines. Whether his people are destined to achieve the independence they so long have cherished, Manuel Quezon dares not predict. For in the war world of 1940, no man can foretell what momentous changes history will have recorded for the world of 1946. Time marches on.